Greetings all. Happy April. This is Rick Levine with your April astrological forecast. And all I can say is what a month we have in front of us. Astrologers have been talking about April of 2024 since sometime late last fall, October, uh, November, December, as we were looking forward to 2024. Uh, April seemed to be like one of the standout months. So before we get into the actual dates, I want to spend a few minutes just, you know, giving you an idea of some of the things that I have coming up. I know that some of you really appreciate this part of my monthly talks, and some of you don't. Well, for those of you who don't, you can either uh, scroll ahead or you can check. There will be chapter headings down below. Uh, they take a day or two for me to get together, and so... Uh, feel free to, 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 to skip ahead if you are so inclined. So just going to go over these pretty briefly. I'm going to put links below in the first comment that I'll pin to the top. So you'll have a way to dig down and get information on, on these. I do want to mention, though, that there are some events that are coming up that I will be announcing via email. And if you're not on my email list, you need to go to ricklevineastrologer.com. That's www.ricklevineastrologer.com. Because, for example, I will be doing a special YouTube live event with uh, British astrologer Steve Judd, and Steve and I have been planning this for a bit, and we have not set an exact date and time yet, but we'll be doing a live YouTube on the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction, and I will notify people of that event via my email list. And so in order to get on that email list, you can put this on pause right now, and you can go to www.ricklevineastrologer.com, sign yourself up for the email list, and be guaranteed that you will get that and other announcements of things that may not appear here. And also, I have a couple of special things coming up that I will be announcing next month for people who are on that mailing list. So, um, that's number one. Number two is that uh, astrology night on the first Friday night of every month, uh, unless I'm out of town, but the first Friday night of April is going to be on the night of April 5th. I know some of you are already aware of this, but April 6th is my birthday, and so this is going to be a special birthday evening or birthday eve celebration, and uh, that will be live streamed on YouTube. It'll be at 6.30 p.m. on Friday, April 5th, and all you need to do is go to youtube.com slash Rick, it's actually slash at sign at Rick Levine, and that'll get you to my um, web page, to my channel, and when we go live at 6.30 or usually within a few minutes of that time, um, the live stream will begin. Um, for those of you who are in the Seattle area and are attending on Friday night, I just want to make the announcement here, and I'll say more about this on the email that I send out to locals later this week, and that is that um, starting uh, this month, there will be a cover charge for the Astrology Night of $5. I do not get that money. I do not make money off of that event, but this goes to cover some of the costs for uh, Soul Food Coffee House staying open beyond its normal uh, business hours, and so it just helps them cover some expenses. If, however, you cannot afford the $5 cover fee, just let them know. We'll have a little bit of a slush fund to make sure that we can cover for, um, uh, for those who, who can't, can't actually uh, pay. So please do not let that be a reason for not attending. And if you're in the Seattle area, that'll be on Friday night, April 5th for Astrology Night. All right, let's see. 
Another thing I want to mention is that a while back I had spoken about a course that I'll be teaching at Kepler College on harmonics, and that has been po postponed to the summer schedule. Uh, I will keep you appraised of that also, um, and so that will be down the road a little bit. In May, I'll be speaking at the Tucson Astrologers Guild, and that'll be the weekend of May 10th and 11th. And on a Friday evening on the 10th, I'll be doing a talk on astrology in the 21st century. And then on Saturday, I'll be doing a deep dive, a, an all-day workshop on the art of astrological consultations and taking that to the next level, whether you're a beginner or a professional or an advanced student, that'll be open for everyone. Now, the other thing is that on that trip, I'll be uh, going up to Sedona and doing an event up there. I don't have the date for that. We have not set what that event will be, but it'll be a few days before or after the Tucson event on May 10th and 11th, and I will announce that uh, next month's forecast. And again, if you're on my mailing list, you'll get a mailing on that so that if you're in the Tucson or Sedona uh, or you know um, Flagstaff or Prescott or wherever you are up that way, and want to attend that event, you'll be able to be kept uh, in the loop on that also. Then on Memorial Day weekend, that's May 23rd through the 27th, there will be NORWAC, the 40th, the 40th annual event here in Seattle, arguably the best of all the regional astrology conferences, uh, which attracts both uh, attendees and speakers from all over the world. And um, I think this is my 34th NORWAC that I've attended. I'll be speaking at it. I'll be doing uh, uh, two lectures, uh, one that'll be a planetary guide through the solar system, kind of an overview of the energies of, of the planets. And then I'll be doing a lecture that will be entitled Overcoming Patriarchal Bias in Natal Chart Interpretation. And, um, and, and for those attending, you'll be able to uh, see those lectures. On Monday the 27th, as a post-conference uh, event, I'll be doing a hands-on Natal Chart Interpretation workshop. And if you've already registered for the conference, I will see you there. If you haven't, um, the registration for the uh, full attendance, uh, the actual in real life attendance, is already full. So you cannot decide now that you're going to be attending NORWAC. However, there will be a virtual conference and and NORWAC does virtual conferences uh, better than anyone else around. So you may want to explore that at norwac.net. And again, all the links for all these events will be um, in the uh, pinned comments below. Uh, that takes us through May. Now in mid-June, actually the weekend of June 7th through 9th, I will be back at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York. It's a, a, an hour and a half or so north of New York City. And I will be there with Lynn Bell, Maurice Fernandez, um, um, Amir Bey, and the keeper of the white, the sacred white lion tradition in South Africa, Linda Tucker. And uh, this is going to be on the focus, the focus is going to be on the changing of the ages and the uh, Aquarius age. However, we're going to be looking at it from the standpoint of the northern and southern hemisphere. So we're going to look at it from the point of polarity, and that is the Leo Aquarius age, because all astrological points have their uh, opposite. And uh, Maurice and I did a discussion on the ages and why the uh, Aquarius age is really Leo and Aquarius. And there'll be a link to that down below, also in the comment section, um, the first comment. And uh, that event in Rhinebeck at the Omega Institute, it's an amazing place. If you've never been there and you can, and you can get yourself there, it's just a great weekend. And again, that's going to be June 7th through 9th, and advanced registrations are required for that. The following weekend, on the weekend of June 15th, actually Saturday, June 15th, 
I will be in Boston at the NCGR monthly meeting, and um, and that they meet in Belmont. The information on that was is on their website, and I'll be doing a Saturday workshop on. Um, it's a relationship workshop, and it's beyond Venus and Mars, and it's a deep dive into relationships, and the write-up and the details on that are on their website, and again, the link is below and um, in the comment section. Then, the end of August, and I know we're talking a little bit out here now, but the reason is that these events are going to take more uh, thinking to uh, maybe plan for them. But on August 28th through September 1st, I will be speaking at the 56th annual Astro Astrological Association, that's the AA in, um, in England, in Great Britain. And the topic for the conference this year is Diverse Perspectives, all themes considered. And this is going to be at the uh, Leonardo Hotel and Conference Center. And this is up near Birmingham, up that way, um, near Coventry. And, um, and for those of you who want more information, that is at the AA, uh, it's on the AA website. And again, the link for that is below. That's the last uh, of August and the 1st of September. And bookings for that won't start until April 5th. So if you're watching this, and you go to the website, the information is not going to be up there in completeness. It's going to say, come back, uh, and that'll be after April 5th. Then in um, mid-October, the weekend of October, actually the October 16th through the 21st, OPA, the Organization for Professional Astrology, um, and the uh, OPA Foundation is uh, having their annual event, and it is going to be at the New Park Resorts in Park City, Utah. This is near Salt Lake City, Utah. And it's going to be an unforgettable uh, retreat conference nestled kind of up in the uh, serene mountains of uh, Park City, Utah. And we have a fabulous faculty of 15 members. And there's going to be um, included in the conference, there's going to be group activities, but three of the four days of the conference are going to be done. There's going to be uh, immersive, um, what do we want to call it, um, immersion track intensives. And uh, the people that are going to be leading these small group intensives, um, including um, me, will be Lynn Bell, Gemini Brett, Anne Orderly, uh, Christopher Renstrom, Sam Reynolds, um, Kira Sutherland, Moon Zlotnick, and Magali Morales. And the information on each of these three-day intensives as part of this larger um, conference are online on the um, OPA, um, OPA, that's opaastrology.org, and the link to the exact page also will be in the comments below. And um, and my three day intensive is going again again going to be on hands on work on chart work and we're going to be looking at the charts of the people who are in the conference as the curriculum and the kind of examples of what it is that we do in a consultation and how to um, increase the effectiveness of your individual chart work. Um, and I should mention that there is reduced pricing on registration for the OPA conference uh, until the end of April. So again, check that out. And then the last thing that I want to mention, and from my perspective, not only the most important thing, not only the thing that'll take perhaps the most planning to pull off, but the most exciting of all of these things for me, and hopefully for you, and that is my 15th retreat that I'm doing with, um, uh, with Heaven and Earth Workshops. And Heaven and Earth Workshops uh, put on retreats, astrology retreats and other retreats around the world. And this particular one is going to be um, my third that I'll be at this, at this magical retreat center in the south part of Goa, India, on the Arabian Sea, on the coast. Um, the retreat center is a three-minute walk down to a magical, beautiful, and swimmable beach um, and that's going to be November 23rd through December 4th, and this is going to be 12 days of full 
immersion astrological experience and uh and goa india is beautiful magical there's a spiritual essence to the land there and um and that's going to um i said i think it was my 15th i think it's my 13th um workshop with heaven and earth workshops uh they do a great job um from the time you get off the plane in india to the time you get back onto the plane pretty much everything is taken care of. There's uh, the complete information, details, curriculum, daily schedule um, is on the heavenandearth.com. Uh, it's, he- it's heavenandearthworkshops.com uh, on their website. And um, this is going to combine the the best of all of my previous teachings through all their workshops. And um and this typically fills up. So if you're interested in this, check it out and get you know get your button gear now while there's still openings because it will be limited to 35 people. And uh, once we reach that, um, that's it. They're, they're, you know you'll be out of luck until next year or until the next long form retreat workshop. So I know that was a bunch of stuff, but I I know there's a lot of you that really kind of go out of your way to want to be able to attend some of these things if you can. And so that completes this portion um, of what we're doing. And now we're going to move into the actual discussion for uh, April of 2024. Okay, so for the overview of April, it's, it's, it's a pretty as, astrologically overwhelming month. We have the solar eclipse in Aries on April 8th, but we begin the month with a stationary retrograde Mercury. Mercury turns retrograde on on April 1st, and it stays retrograde um, throughout most of the month. Mercury, well, we'll, we'll come back and we'll discuss that Mercury um, in more detail in, in, in a few moments. Um, but the thing about Mercury and Mercury's retrograde is that it goes retrograde on the 1st and it turns direct on April 25th, which means that pretty much all of April is locked up with mercurial energy either retracing its old steps or at the end of the month just coming out of its retrograde and still moving within its shadow. We'll dive deeper on that in just a moment. So we have Mercury retrograde. We have a solar eclipse, the second in a pair of eclipses, the first one being the uh, lunar eclipse that we've just experienced on uh, March 25th. But we also have a one in 14 year event, and that is the Jupiter Uranus conjunction. I mentioned earlier, for any of you who skipped through the announcements, that I'll be doing a special live, a YouTube live event with British astrologer Steve Judd, um, whose work I really appreciate. And I know many of you um, who follow my work also know about Steve and Steve's work. And we'll be doing a special event. And I will announce that uh, the particulars on that live event via my email. So again, if you're not on my email list, make sure that you go to www.ricklevineastrologer, all one word, ricklevineastrologer.com, and get yourself on that list so that you can join us for that deep dive into the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. This is not going to be, the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction on April 20th is not about a one-day event, because even at the beginning of the month on April 1st, we have Jupiter and Uranus that are already conjoined. They're three degrees of orb from being exact. And so the entire month of April is going to be uh, partly an expression of this Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. Uh, And I'll say more about that in, in a moment, but I just want to stick with the overview for the month right now. And the other thing is that because there are so many planets clustered so close together, with the exception of the moon, which obviously goes around the zodiac in its entirety over the course of one moon, one month, that Pluto, which is lagging behind back at the very beginning of Aquarius, aside from those two points, Mars, Saturn, Venus, Neptune, all 
in Pisces, the Sun, the nodal axis, North Node, Chiron, and Mercury, all in Aries, and Jupiter and Uranus in Taurus. What this means is that all of the faster-moving planets are moving into the slower-moving planets, and we have a month with nine planetary conjunctions. This is incredibly unusual, and in fact, because these planets are all so close together, not only are there nine <clears throat> um, conjunctions, and I never really got around to counting them, but there's more um, semi-sextiles than I've ever seen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten... Uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. There's like about oh, oh, nearly 20 semi sextiles this month. <clears throat> and I know that many astrologers don't use semi sextiles, um, but they're a significant aspect because when two planets are semi sextile, that means if they're impacting anything in your natal chart, that means that they are at the same time either sextiling and squaring a point in your chart, or squaring and trining a point in your chart. And so there's always this kind of quincunxy energy that is both mm, easy and complicated at the same time. And so this is another piece of why April is such a powerful and unique month, because of the cluster and the um, compression, the condensation of energy, which then leads me to the other planetary conjunctions that are this month. I, I mentioned the perhaps the the slowest moving, the um, the rarest of them, which is the Jupiter Uranus conjunction on April twentieth. But aside from that, we have Mars at the beginning of the month at seven degrees of Pisces faster than Saturn moving into its conjunction, and that conjunction occurs on April 10th, very close to the eclipse on, on April um, 8th, and we'll have more to say about that, but this is another one of those conjunctions that's extremely important, and what's interesting is that as Mars kind of races through Pisces this month. It's in Pisces um, until the end of the month, and Mars enters Aries on April 30th, and we'll get to the sign changes in just a moment, because there's a bunch of those in April. Like I said, April is a month chock full of of intensity, of change, of focus, and yet Mercury is retrograde. So it's almost like we're getting to experience all these things with an eye to what's happened before getting ready to something for something that will happen in the future. Um, okay, so we have the Mars conjuncting Saturn on April 10th, but as Mars races through um, uh, through Pisces, Mars will actually um, move into Aries on April 30th, which means that Mars will join up with Neptune at the very end of Pisces. You remember, Neptune right now at the beginning of the month is at 2755 Pisces. It's almost 28 degrees of Pisces. By the end of the month, it is actually at 29 degrees of Pisces, but it turns retrograde. And so it never reaches the zero degree Aries point until um, next year. So what this means, though, is that Mars conjoins with Saturn, Mars hot, fast, um, accelerating, energetic, reaching Saturn, cold, restraining, holding back. And this is the beginning of the month as Mercury is turning retrograde. We're already feeling this Mars moving toward this conjunction with Saturn because it's already about five degrees of orb even at the beginning of the month. Five, it's actually six degrees of, uh, of orb, seven degrees to 13 degrees. But 
as Mars continues moving through Pisces, Mars will catch up with Neptune at 28 degrees of Pisces in 52 minutes. That's just about 29 degrees of Pisces, and it'll do that on April 28th. And this is a very different flavor because this is Mars being dispersed, Mars's energy being um, being released, being uh, um, kind of transforming, being less physical than Mars normally is. And that's intriguing because just two days later, Mars moves into Aries, into its home sign, where it's very physical, very immediate, very present, and we'll have more to say about that as we look at the month of May, because the month of May has Mars moving through Aries for the entire month. Now, getting back to the conjunctions of the month of April, of which I said there were a number, we also have the Sun moving through Aries, catching up with Chiron, and that is exactly on the day of the solar eclipse on April 8th. And it actually occurs within eight minutes of Earth time of the actual solar eclipse itself. And I'll have a lot more to say about that when we talk about the eclipse on April 8th. We also have Mercury moving through Aries, and it catches up with Chiron on April 15th. And and I should say something here about Mercury's conjunctions, because um, Mercury actually joins up with Chiron on April 15th, and it um, joins up with Venus on April 19th. And because Mercury is retrograde, that Mercury has already joined up with Chiron. It did that back on March 20th. And it will do it for the third and final time as it's moving direct um, on May 6th. So this Mercury-Chiron alignment is significant because Chiron is so tightly so closely tied to the solar eclipse, and yet Mercury gives us the chance, the opportunity to use communication to actually heal and to learn and to teach and to do all those things that Chiron is so involved with, um, and that's exact um, on the retrograde on uh, on a- April 15th. Um, by the way, um, Mercury also makes a half square with Mars on April 6th. And it's that's a repeat aspect also. It did that back on March 14th. And the reason why I give you these back dates is that if you look back on your calendar to what was going on on March 14th when Mercury moving direct was was squ- half squaring, semi squaring to Mars, that may give you clues to what it, the issues are that you need to work on while Mercury is now retrograding back over that point of, of Mars um, on April 6th. Incidentally, when Mercury finally turns direct, it never catches up to Mars, so there's not a third and final time. It's really one of those rare things where you get the direct, the retrograde, but by the time Mercury turns direct, Mars has moved onward and it's out of range of, of, of Mercury. And while we're talking about conjunctions, we then have Mercury also joining up with Venus on April 19th, and that's within just a, a day of the actual uh, Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. And so there's, again, some significance here as far as communication goes, um, and we'll have more to say about that also. On the 21st, we have Venus joining up with conjoining Chiron. And, And again, Chiron is important all month, not only because the solar eclipse on April 8th is conjoined to Chiron, but because we have Mercury sweeping across Chiron um, retrograde and then Venus going across it direct on the 21st. Um, And um, it's just, I've I've never seen a month with so many conjunctions um, that are all interplaying and and intertwined. And I think it's very significant significant, uh, because April has a lot of focus to it. And yet, I just want to say for the last time, well, maybe I'll say it again, and that is because Mercury is retrograde, it might feel like 
things are being set up, but we're not getting the, um, it, it might feel like there is the, you know, the other shoe that's left to fall, the other, the follow through that isn't quite ready to occur. And yet I think that as we look back at April from later on in the year and in the years ahead, April will be like the standout month that will be the significant month. So, Let's jump in. Let's take it uh, going through the month and taking a look at some of the highlights. For those of you who are um, Patreon subscribers, and Patreon, of course, is uh, patreon.com slash Rick Levine. And if you are a Patreon subscriber, then you get the mid-month update. And typically on the mid-month update, I follow the lunar transits much, much more in detail for the second half of the month. The first part of the month, I try to take an overview of the whole month. And so that's what we're going to do now. Let's shift gears and look at the chart for April 1st. As I've said many times before, when we're looking at charts, we're looking at noon charts, unless I mention otherwise, sometimes, well, for the eclipse and for the well, for new moons and full moons, we typically have the chart of that time. But mostly we're looking at the charts for noon, and that's noon in Redmond, Washington, that specific daylight time. So you need to adjust your time zone accordingly. That means there's no horizon in my charts that we're looking at. Uh, you cannot use any house interpretations. Uh, houses are a function of where you are on the planet, so you need to look at the chart from your perspective in order to get what an ascendant, midheaven, and various houses are. Um, we are beginning by looking at the chart for April 1st at noon. We can see that the moon is um, the moon is in Capricorn. The moon actually entered Capricorn uh, last night. And when I say last night, I'm always talking by the date that appears on the chart. We're looking at the chart of April 1st. And so when I say last night, I mean the night of March 31st. And in fact, I should also say for the record, I am recording this on the evening of, um, uh, it's actually Easter evening on Sunday, March 31st. Um, but uh, the moon in the chart for the beginning of April is already in Capricorn. And I think that's interesting because when we look at the beginnings of everything, we get a sense of what that's about. And Saturn does play a role this month because Mars is moving toward that conjunction with Saturn. We can see here that the uh, Mars at 7 degrees and Saturn at 13 degrees. Mars is moving toward that conjunction that's exact on, that's perfected exact on the 10th, and we'll get there in just a moment. But the other thing that I want to also start off here and mention is that we can see that Mercury shows here as, with a little S on it, as stationary. That stationary retrograde, Mercury, for all practical purposes, um, is not moving. Um, if we go back, you know, uh, a day and forward a day um, to the second, Mercury is still going to be at 27 or in that, you know, same degree, at 27 degrees of, of Aries. And, um, and Mercury being stationed today, it technically makes that exact station at 3.14 p.m., but it really, for all practical purposes, is not moving for the last day and for the next day, and then it'll take several days to pick up speed, but we may feel the energy of that Mercury retrograde um, pretty strongly right at the beginning of, of the month. Now, I should also make the observation that when a planet turns retrograde like Mercury, it does it after having moved as far forward as it's going to get in this phase. It turns retrograde, and then when it turns direct again, there's an area of the sky that it covers forward, backward, and then forward again, and we call this the shadow. This shadow, actually, Mercury entered its shadow um, on um, March 18th, 
and it entered its shadow when it actually um, reached the point where it um, will eventually um, retrograde back to. So right now, Mercury has moved ahead to 27 degrees of Aries, um, and the area that it will be in its shadow um, is will be all the way until it turns direct. Mercury turns direct, as I'd mentioned, as I'd mentioned earlier, on April 25th, and when it turns direct, it will turn direct at 15, almost 16 degrees, 15 degrees and 59 minutes of Aries, and so. In effect, what we know is that Mercury hit that 15 degree, 59 minutes of Aries on March 18th, which really means that from March 18th all the way to the point where Mercury turns retrograde, that's on the 1st of April, all the way until Mercury backs all the way up to that point where it's going to turn direct, um, which is on the um, 20, 25th of April, and then when it turns direct, it's going to take until May 13th, until it gets past that point, which where it actually turned retrograde, which is where it is right now on April, on April 1st. So the point is here that from March 18th all the way through, um, through May 13th, Mercury is moving through its shadow. And in fact, it's interesting to note that when Mercury is moving at top speed, it's moving through a sign in about two weeks. It moves almost two degrees a day. And right now, Mercury is moving through Aries. It entered Aries on March 9th, and it doesn't enter Taurus until May 15th, meaning that Mercury will be over two months in Aries. And so, again, this is adding to that whole sense of things being speeded up. Our minds are moving fast, even if they're not going anywhere, or even if they're not going anywhere as fast as we would like them to, while Mercury is retrograde for, um, for the entire, pretty much the, the entire month of, of April, at least till the 25th. So we note that Mercury retrograde on the first day of the month, and that is that that is important. As we move ahead, we also notice here on the first of the month that Venus is only a couple of degrees away from Neptune. Venus at 25 degrees, and often I will say the degrees by just dropping the number of minutes. We have Neptune at 27 degrees and 55 minutes. That's almost 28 degrees. So it's going to have to cross over Neptune. And so we're going to have that Venus-Neptune conjunction, which I'm going to come back and talk about in just a moment. But Venus is moving quickly enough that it moves into Taurus on April 29th. So at the end of the month... <clears throat> We get Venus and Mars both changing signs, Mars moving out of Pisces into Aries on the 30th, and Venus moving out of Aries and into Taurus on the 29th. Now, the other thing that occurs is um, that um, the Sun obviously changes signs mid-month, and we'll get there. That's on April 19th. So I just wanted to mention those sign changes. Those are obviously separate from the Moon sign changes, because the Moon changes signs every couple of days, two and a half, two and a quarter to two and a half days. So here we are back at the chart for April 1st. We're going to move it ahead to April 2nd. Um, and then we're going to move it ahead to April 3rd, and we can see that Venus now is catching up to Neptune, and on the 3rd, it's actually at 6 in the morning on the 3rd, that Venus actually jumps ahead of Neptune, so by the time it's noon on April 3rd, we can see that Venus is now ahead of Neptune, and when Venus lines with Neptune and for the day or two before, this is a bit of dreaminess. This is a bit of uncertainty because what we like, what we want, what we wish for, um, those things that bring us pleasure, Venus, are a bit ethereal. They're, they're not necessarily tied to reality. And this is 
kind of a bit of a dilemma because at the same time we have Mars getting closer and closer to its conjunction with Saturn, which will be around the eclipse in the day or two after a bit of a reality check as Mars brings us back down into reality as it joins up with Saturn. But meanwhile, here on the third, we have a bit of spaciness, a bit of uh, kind of uh, um, dreaminess and yet by the 4th, and this is later in the day, um, by the 4th afternoon, actually it's 9 p.m., Venus will leave, Ari- leave Pisces and move into Aries, where what we want becomes a bit more mm, urgent. It becomes a bit more here and now. And this becomes a lot of the tune of April, that feeling like we want fulfillment. We want energy to kind of complete itself now, but... The problem, of course, is that with Mercury retrograde, um, we're not actually um, mentally, intellectually moving into those newer places we're going to be covering old territory again, so it may feel a little bit frustrating. And I think that that frustration will actually build until um, around the eclipse in a couple days after, because as long as Mars is moving towards Saturn, we have the heat and the fire and the energy of the accelerator, Mars, kind of running into Saturn, the, the wall, the break. And we get a bit of that energy um, again on the, uh, or not again, but we get a bit of that energy, that flavor um, on the 6th, because on the 6th, at uh, just past midnight, Mercury makes a half square to Mars, and this is Mercury retrograding, and I mentioned this earlier because that Mercury made a half square to Mars back on um, March 14th, and now as Mercury retrograde makes that half square to Mars, we're kind of in this conflict between being able to think our way clear and knowing where we want to be and how it's going to work. And yet, as as Mercury backs into that half square to Mars, energetically, we're not able to work it out. There's definitely some frustration and some conflict here. Um, the good news is that, that Venus... Um, as it moves into Aries, um, it begins to pick up on a sextile to Pluto. That sextile is exact um, on the morning of April 6th. Um, In fact, we can see here that by noon, um, Venus has reached just barely two degrees of Aries, so it's just past its exact sextile to Pluto. And this, in some ways, is we're getting frustration intellectually, Mercury, but somehow Venus is working it out. There's there's something here about maybe getting a little bit of what it is that we want or having a an ability to see beneath the surface because there's Pluto energy where we're able to do that that deeper dive. Now, notice here also that the moon moving through Pisces, and I didn't mention, um, but I but I should mention that the moon actually, um, on the first of the month, like I said, the moon was in Capricorn. The moon moved into Aquarius um, on April 3rd, early in the morning. And then on the 5th at 4.12 a.m., it moved into Pisces. And as the moon moved into Pisces um, early in the morning on the 5th and through the 5th and on into the 6th, even into the early morning hours of the 7th, the moon, as it's moving through Pisces, is lining up with Mars, heating it up, with Saturn cooling it off, and then with Neptune. But here um, we can see that, that as we move through the 6th, and then into the 7th, we can see that the moon is moving closer and closer to its conjunction with the sun. The moon actually enters Aries on the morning of the 7th at 4.24 a.m. It'll line up with Venus um, just a little bit after that. But the point here is, is that we're heading toward this solar eclipse because the nodal axis, the north node of the moon, at 15 degrees of Aries, and the sun um, on the 7th um, at 18 degrees of Aries, if we move this ahead to the, um, to the 8th, we can now see that the sun makes 
uh, I'm sorry, the moon makes its conjunction with the sun. Um, and the fact is that this eclipse occurs just before noon on the um on the west coast of the United States, again, you need to adjust your timing, uh, you know, to where to wherever it is that you are on the planet. But the significant thing here is that that this eclipse occurs with the moon at 19 degrees of Aries in 24 minutes. It's conjoined the sun, obviously, because that's what an eclipse is, at 19 degrees Aries of 20 and 24 minutes, but Chiron is also, and I mentioned this earlier, at 19 degrees and 24 minutes of Aries, meaning that this eclipse is within within just minutes of arc. This eclipse is actually joined up with with Chiron, um, and the um, Sun Chiron conjunction um, is very significant because it is part of the eclipse itself. The eclipse occurs at 11:20 a.m. Pacific time, and the Sun's perfection of its conjunction to Chiron occurs at 11:28, just eight minutes after totality of the eclipse. Now, what does this mean? It means that we are in touch at once with our hurt, our wound, our humanness, those things which are not okay, those things which are happening now which remind us, whether we're aware of it or not, of things that happened back in the past that may have been, um, that may have inflicted either emotional or even physical wounds, but that these things may not be part of our conscious memory, but in some way this eclipse is bringing that energy up. Now the advantage here is that this gives us an opportunity to to, to remember, to, to take that cut off, that dismembered part of our <coughs> physicalness or of our awareness and to remember it, to reconnect to it so that we're not uh, doomed to repeat these, these wounds, these memories of things that may not have anything to do with what's going on in the present moment. Now, this is especially important when it comes to behaviors that are tied to behaviors in the past that somehow we're not we're not making the connection because we're looking at an event in the present moment as the event and yet we're not aware of the fact that if we can, can connect it if we can connect it to its history that we can free ourselves from repeating the history of that which we can't remember remember that Chiron is not only about the wound of the healer, but it's also about the action of healing. It's about the healing that occurs from teaching. And Chiron was a healer because Chiron had the ability to teach. He was really the first mentor. Um, Chiron was um, Asclepius's teacher, was Hercules' teacher. And so here we have the opportunity to both teach and to learn. And it's not the same kind of Saturn learning where it's discipline and you get, you know, kind of having the teacher, you know, like hitting you over the head with like, learn this, learn this, you have to do. It's not the taskmaster. It's more the being open to that learning. And that openness sometimes ha occurs with a remembrance of the past or the ability to forgive that part of ourselves that has closed ourselves off to learning, or maybe even forgiving others for not learning what we already know or think we know as the truth. So this is a very, very powerful event. And I should also note here that Mars getting closer and closer to its conjunction to Saturn is part of this eclipse. And so we have that frustration of feeling like we're really going somewhere. Mars, we don't know where, it's in Pisces, and it's going towards Saturn, which is the wall. Oh my God, this is frustration. This is this this is a feeling of like, I'm not sure how I'm going to break through this. And yet, at the same time, we also now have the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction, which isn't exact until April 20th, but look how close they are now. They're just two degrees of orb, just slightly over that. And the point here is that we're getting this, this beginnings 
of this opening that will continue to to uh, build until April 20th, and then we'll have resonance from this for days, for weeks, for months to occur. But this is Jupiter, the expansive planet, the 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 planet of learning, of 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 opportunity, of growth, of potential, because that's what Jupiter is. It makes things larger. It's the magnifying lens. It's expansive. And what's Jupiter expanding here? Uranus. And what's Uranus? It's that moment of shock, of awakening, of surprise, of breakthrough, of, oh my God, I had no idea. It's when the lightning strikes and for a moment we get to see everything. Uranus is the quantum planet. Why? Because it's it's impossible it's it's somehow particle and wave uranus is the you is the unpredictable it's predicting that which is unpredictable when when you're in the midst of a of a, of a storm and and you can see the lightning and hear the thunder and you know it's going to strike again you don't know where and you don't know when but you know it's going to strike and yet when it strikes, it's always a surprise. And so this is what the awareness and the opening of Jupiter meeting up with Uranus. And although there may be something or things that happen right around this April um, eclipse on April 8th, all the way up through the exact um, conjunction on the 20th and the days that follow, this is not about a single event. It's about a 14-year cycle that actually creates this this expansiveness around the ability to break through by by becoming aware. This is this is learning things, um, and we're back to Chiron as the teacher. This is about learning things that we've been closed off to learn because it's been it, it's tied to some wound. This is tied to something that we've believed is true, and yet now we're having to confront the fact that maybe the earth that we're standing on that we once thought was flat is actually a globe. Now, it's easy for us moderners to realize that because we were brought up with that understanding. But there are things that we each have that are beliefs that are that are whether they're they're whether they're personal beliefs, beliefs about someone we know, whether they're political beliefs, and I think this is a big part of it, whether they're beliefs about how we see our place in the outer world. This eclipse is set to 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 shatter some of those beliefs, and and either we will pay the price for not allowing that lightning striking to awaken us and to see what's going on because denial ultimately doesn't work. It brings us pain. It brings us suffering. Um, And again, this is not just a single event, but it's an incredibly important um, eclipse because of its exact conjunction uh, with a Chiron, because of how close it is to the nodal axis, meaning it's a total eclipse, um, and because we also have this Mars-Saturn conjunction that's building and the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction that's building. Um, there's going to be a lot of other astrologers talking about the eclipse. In fact, uh, many of you may have seen the eclipse workshop that I was part of on Astrology Hub um, that I think is available um, through Astrology Hub uh, if you're so inclined to uh, check that out. Um, And I'll be talking a lot more about the eclipse on Astrology Night on April 5th, um, just because we'll only be a few days away from it at that point in time. So let's move beyond the eclipse um, and on April 8th, um, oh, the other thing that we have going on on April 8th before we leave it is also the fact that even though Jupiter is moving towards its conjunction with Uranus, um, we have Venus, which is moving faster. Um, Venus is making a half square with Jupiter on the day of the eclipse on April 8th. Um, and, um, and, and Venus will actually make a half square with Uranus on the 9th because, because, Ven- because Jupiter and Uranus are so close together that, this, that Venus is sweeping through this half square in some way making us uneasy 
with what it is that we might have to learn, where it is we might have to grow, what it is we might have to accept as real, what the breakthroughs are that are still unfolding. But as Venus is making these half squares to um, to Jupiter on the 8th and to Uranus on the 9th, and uh, that'll become increasingly Im important. And by the way, um, Venus, as it continues moving on, as it moves into, into um, Venus moves into Taurus, it will make a half square with uh, Saturn on the 30th, and we'll get there as we get to the end of the month. Like I said, uh, April is just a crazy month. There's so much going on. I can't even begin to talk about it all. Let's jump ahead um, to the uh, 10th. And on the uh, the tenth at noon, um, we can now see that Mars uh, is at the same degree as Saturn. It's only just minutes of arc separating the two of them, and the conjunction is exact. Perfected is the technical astrological word. Um, the Mars Saturn uh, conjunction perfects. Uh, at 1.36 p.m., of course, that's Pacific Daylight Time. But again, this is something we're going to be feeling already. We'll be feeling it during the eclipse. And this is, you know, the energy hitting the wall. This is not being able to break through in the way that we think we should be able to break through. And the crazy thing about the timing of all of this is that the moon, which was obviously in Aries at the moment of the eclipse, on the 9th moved into Taurus, actually er early in the morning on the 9th, um, but then the moon actually sweeps through its conjunctions with the closing, tightening conjunction of Jupiter and Uranus. And you can see here uh, at noon on April 10th, on Wednesday the 10th, that we have Mars conjoining Saturn, same degree, just almost exact, and the moon ready to sweep through over the next couple of hours over Jupiter and Uranus. And so we're getting this, oh my God, there's new, there's, there's potential, there's possibility, things are happening, things are opening up, and oh my God, we can't go there, we're being held back, we've hit a wall, everything is stopping. And this is the, the beautiful dilemma of what April is about. And of course, I, I don't need to say this again, but I'm going to, and that is that Mercury is retrograde. And so we're reconsidering, we're reviewing, we're, we're remembering, we're, we're, we're seeing things again, but they're not quite the way we saw them uh, last time. And so all of this is in play. And in fact, by the 11th, Mercury retrograding, retrogrades back across the sun. So this is a, um, in effect, a, an inferior conjunction of Mercury and the Sun, meaning that if you drew a straight line from the Earth to the Sun, um, you'd go through that place where Mercury is moving across the, 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 the Sun itself. And that conjunction is in the afternoon of the 11th. Um, and so that by the time we get to the 12th and the 13th, uh, we can see that Mercury has retrograded back across the sun. Um, and we're going to jump to the 13th because on the 13th, um, we have Mars now um, past its conjunction to Saturn um, is making a half square to Pluto. Now, remember, the Mars-Pluto stuff does not have, <laughs> it doesn't have a recent nice history. And I'm not going to go back and paint the exact dates, except remember that um, that October 6th of last year um, was the um, Mars coming into um, squaring Pluto. And, um, and so we have this kind of uh, power struggle that is often played out in assertion, aggression, war, conflict. And so April 13th has certainly more of this energy tied up with it, and especially with the Saturn Mars now kind of loosening up and the breaking through um, happening, but Mars making a half square with Pluto, there's a sense again of the deeper power struggle is not going away. 
by the time we reach the 15th, we have Mercury retrograding back, getting closer and closer to Chiron. And by the time we reach the 15th, we can see that retrograde Mercury backs over Chiron. And again, this is about communication, Mercury, learning how to either forgive or to be forgiven, to go into some place where we can learn a new behavior so we're not forced to report, to, to report, to repeat the same thing again and again and again. Remember, part of Mercury's job um, historically, mythologically, was the, the psychopomp, and that is Mercury was was the guide through the underworld. The underworld is not just the place where we go after we die, the hell realms, the, the realms of uh, uh, consciousness that's not physical. It's not just about the underworld, that which is underground. It's the unconscious. And Mercury guides us into those realms. And it's significant that we have Mars making this half square to Pluto that we're just coming out of, that Mars half square to Pluto was on the 13th. And now on the 15th, Mercury makes a conjunction with Chiron in a way saying, yeah, we know that maybe there were some physical um, alterations, uh, altercations, sorry that there may have been some some power games being lived out in the three-dimensional world, but now as Mercury lines up with Chiron, perhaps it's time to allow ourselves to be led into a place by Mercury, intellect, communication, where we can see where we are in a way that is different than where we thought we were. It was Marcel Proust who once said that the only true journey is seeing not seeing new places, but the only true journey is seeing the same place through new eyes. And I think that that's what we're uh, being afforded here through the middle of April, and in particular, as Mercury reaches its conjunction with Chiron on the 15th. On the 16th and 17th, we have a bunch of semi-sextiles. That's a half of a sextile. And I'm not going to talk about any of them by themselves, but I do want to say that there are more semi-sextiles this month than I've ever seen between planets in a month ever. I mentioned at the beginning that there was a lot of conjunctions. There were nine planetary conjunctions, or there are nine planetary conjunctions throughout the month of April, which is extraordinary. There's a lot of compression and focus and and even unconsciousness, because when two planets are lined up, the energy comes together, but we can't see one from the other because they're in the same place. The semi-sextile, though, as I said earlier when I was mentioning this, they're, they're, about, they're uncomfortable. They're about adjustments. They're about things not quite getting along. And we're getting a lot of these um, through the 16th and 17th. Mercury making a semi-sextile with Mars and, and Venus making a semi-sextile with, with, with Saturn and Mars making a semi-sextile with Chiron. And then on the 17th, the Sun making a semi-sextile with Neptune. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about all these separately, because as we get toward the end of the month, the, se the semi-sextiles just stack up so fast that it's just crazy. But, but it kind of is indicative of, of, of those things as we get closer and closer. It's like two musical notes. As they get closer and closer together, and if they're not exactly in tune, they sound worse and worse and worse. And um, it's uh, Robert Frost's poem, Good Fences Make Good Neighbors. And when things get so close together, it's like the fences disappear in a way. And we're aware of how, of the dissonance going back to the musical term. And I really think that this is an, um, is, 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 is an undertone, if there's such a word to use in this framework, an undertone of this kind of annoyance, dissonance, irritation of things being so close and uncomfortable that we can't separate them and we can't get any distance, we can't get our focus on them, but they are being smushed together harder and harder. And and I think that this is all intriguing as we're moving closer and closer to the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction, because you can see here by the 15th, Jupiter and Uranus are only one degree apart now, inching closer and closer and closer together. 
And now we're going to jump to the 19th, because moving through the 16th and 17th, there's mostly a lot of these semi-sextiles. And yet, as we move to the 19th, we get an exact conjunction, a perfection of Mercury and Venus. And this is retrograde Mercury backing over Venus. And here there's a focus between communication, Mercury and Venus, what we want, what we like, what we're, what we're attracted to. And, and, and interestingly enough, Venus is getting closer and closer to its conjunction, um, with Chiron, which is exact on the 21st, and, and it's almost impossible to pull out how much is going on through these few days, because now we see that on the 19th, Jupiter and Uranus are now in the same degree. Um, they're within a, a quarter of a degree, within even less than that, of being exactly perfected in their conjunction, which is exact tomorrow on the 20th. But here on the 19th, we have Mercury conjoining with, um, with, with uh, Venus, uh, speaking our truth about what is beautiful and being able to intellectualize what, what, we, what, what we want. Not what we need, that's the moon, but what we want. There's just so much going on, it's hard to uh, put it all into, into a single statement. But as the moon is moving through Virgo on the 19th, it's also getting closer and closer to entering Libra, which it does on the 20th um, in the evening. And this is important because as the moon is moving um, into Libra, it's going to then eventually move opposite uh, the nodal axis. It's going to go over the nodal axis and over Mercury and Venus and Chiron. Um, but here back on the 19th, we have another thing that occurs that is incredibly important. And that is on the morning of the 19th, the sun leaves Aries and enters Taurus. Now, we have the sun moving into Taurus, which is the same sign as which Jupiter joins um, Uranus in. And Taurus is the primary sign of Venus. It's Venus's home um, sign. Venus is at home in Taurus. And of course, Venus during this period of time is being visited by mental Mercury and moving towards closer and closer toward its conjunction with Chiron. And so this kind condensation and complication of energy is just amazing. And we also have on the 19th, Mars at 21 degrees of Pisces. 21 degrees is the same degree at which Jupiter and Uranus are conjoining. And even though they don't exactly conjoin perfected um, tomorrow evening on the 20th, here on the 19th, um, Mars makes its perfected sextile. It's exact sextile to Jupiter at 8.30, actually 8.28 a.m., and then makes its sextile to Uranus at 4.55 p.m. And so even though the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction isn't exact until tomorrow, the 20th, here on the 19th, we have so much stuff going on and, Mer and, and um, Mars energizing this that we can perhaps get really excited and feel really good about what's happening, or we might actually be afraid of what's happening because so much is going on all of a sudden that's releasing energy, and we may not want it to go in the way that we see it going. We may, in fact, react one way or another. Remember, when when it rains, it's not necessarily a bad day. It's only bad if you have your suntan lotion and you're heading to the beach. But if you're a duck, it's a great day because there's no humans at the beach and the beach is yours. So when things happen astrologically, even if they look good, like Mars making a sextile with Jupiter and Uranus, as Jupiter and Uranus are making their one in 14 year conjunction, it's not necessarily good for everyone because everyone is different. What's good for the goose here is not necessarily what's good for the gander. All right, 
Let's move to the 20th on the day of the exact Jupiter um, Uranus conjunction. And, um, and we can see here um, at noon on the 20th that they are both at 21 degrees um, and 40 some odd minutes of, um, of, of Taurus. They're just minutes apart. Um, and this again is incredibly powerful because Uranus is the planet of the future. Uranus is the planet that um, we moderners associate with Aquarius. And this now brings us back to Pluto moving into Aquarius and this energy of Aquarius and these harbingers of the Aquarius age, which still may be a century away because ages are so slow moving in their transition. But this Jupiter-Uranus conjunction is another harbinger of this 20-year period of, of Pluto moving through Aquarius, and yet at the same time we have the Sun in Taurus moving towards a square with Pluto in Aquarius. That's not exact until tomorrow, the 21st, but we're feeling a little bit of this, maybe this isn't as good as we think it is. Whether this is a AI or ASI, <clears throat> and ASI is simply the extension of AI, artificial intelligence. ASI is artificial superintelligence, which is where we're heading. Or whether it's AI or ET, there's something here about not feeling comfortable as a human with where it is we're going and what it is in the future. As the sun comes into the squaring with Pluto, uh, Pluto being in Aquarius and Jupiter magnifying that Uranian energy, even though it's in Taurus, it's <laughs> the Uranus is, is the planet of Aquarius, so to speak. And so this is very complicated and yet very futuristic and things are really moving fast and it's hard to keep up with everything, especially as now Venus back in Aries is moving towards its conjunction with Chiron. And it's also important to note that here on the 20th, on the day of the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction in Taurus, that Venus, <clears throat> who's the dispositor or the planet that does the active work for planets moving through its domicile Taurus, that on this day, Venus at 19 degrees of Aries is actually on the point of the eclipse, um, the eclipse that occurred back <laughs> on, uh, on, on uh, April 8th, that eclipse occurred on April 8th at 19 degrees of Aries, and now we have Venus at that same point. So this is all intertwining, intermingling this, this energy. And I said earlier that Uranus was the quantum planet. And of course, in quantum mechanics, there's this thing of called entanglement that says once two things touch, that even if they're far away or far away in time, that somehow they're still connected. And I think we're seeing that play out here as we move through this Jupiter-Uranus conjunction on the 21st and on, on the 20th and then on the 21st as Venus is actually now catching up to and aligning um, with Chiron, the Venus-Chiron conjunction um, occurring on the morning of the, the 21st. As we move on, oh, and also on the 21st, and I mentioned this earlier already, that is the sun perfects its square to Pluto, but I think we've been feeling that, you know, since the sun moved into um, Taurus back on the 19th, I think we've been in range of this, this conflict between these two fixed signs. One is the Taurus fixed in practicality, feet on the ground, Earth, and the other, the, the Pluto in Aquarius, um, the kind of gradual transformations that are occurring in the, in the Aquarian air realm, the intellectual and the mental and the conceptual framework. Um, is, this is a, a, an incredibly potent and powerful period, period of time. Now, at, we can see here that the moon on the 21st has also already moved into Libra. Um, I mentioned that the moon moved into Libra. I think I mentioned the time at 8.08 p.m. on April 20th. Um, and what that means is that we are moving toward um, the full moon, and the full moon occurs um, on the 23rd. And the full moon on the 23rd um, occurs at 4.48 p.m. 
and this means that the moon has already moved into um, into Scorpio. The moon moves into Scorpio on the morning of um, uh, Tuesday, April twenty third, um, at eight nineteen a.m. and the um, and and the moon is actually um, full um, by. Uh, 4:48 p.m. is when the exact full moon occurs, and um, and this is the Scorpio full moon, um, which is uh, a, a significant full moon. It's a, f- a full moon of becoming. It's the first full moon in Taurus where things actually become real. But because the moon is in Scorpio. They're also complicated, and I think that this April twenty third full moon is going to be significant, and and yet there's a couple of other things that are occurring, um, and one of them I'd already mentioned, and that is that as we go from the twenty second through the twenty eighth, we have one, two, three, four, five, six semi sextiles, and again there are too many to drill into specifically one at a time but from the 22nd through the 28th we have venus forming a semi-sextile with uranus and with uh, jupiter we have mercury forming a sex- semi-sextile with saturn venus forming a semi-sextile with mars venus forming a semi-sextile with neptune the mercury forming a semi-sextile um with with, with saturn it's, it's just incredible as to the complexity of the high frequency irritations that we're experiencing around this full moon that is also um, the time of the previous eclipse back on April 8th of that energy coming into fulfillment or coming into um, a maximum um, a culmination, if, if you will. Um, there's there's two other things that are important as we move toward the end of the month. Um, one of them is that Mercury has begun in its retrograde motion slowing down. Um, it never quite reaches its conjunction with the nodal axis. Um, here on the 23rd, we can see that it's at about 16 degrees of, of Aries. Um, but that Mercury actually turns direct. It begins its station, and Mercury turns direct technically. I always say technically because... It really depends where you are on the planet because the rotation of the Earth actually can impact that moment of whether it looks like Mercury is going forward or backward. Um, and uh, But the actual technical direct turn is at 5.54 a.m. on April 25th. And we can see here um, on the 24th that Mercury is at 16 degrees um, of, of, of Aries. Um, and on and, and it backs up to 15 degrees and 59 minutes, but then on the 25th it's at 15 degrees and 59 minutes, still right around 16 degrees, and then by the following day on the 26th it's only at 16 degrees three minutes, and so Mercury is basically hovering in that um, at, at that 16 degree point. Um, And this is, again, a very powerful transition point because Mercury over the days ahead, not today, but over the days ahead, will begin to pick up speed as it moves back through its shadow the third and final time, not moving out of its shadow until we get to May 13th, which is when Mercury actually leaves its shadow and heads into new territory where it hasn't been territory that is now breaking into into new ground. So it's quite a month. Ah, there's one other thing that I think is quite significant as we move toward the end of the month. And I mentioned a couple of these pieces before, um, and um, and that is that on the 28th, Mars, which has been moving um, closer and closer to uh, to Neptune here on the 26th, we can see that uh, Mars is still a degree away, a, a degree and a half away from its conjunction with Neptune. But by the time we reach midday on April 28th, Mars is within a half a degree 
of its conjunction. And in fact, if we move to the 29th, we can see that Mars um, will be on the other side of Neptune. Mars has passed its conjunction, and it's very significant here because the Mars conjunction with Neptune is kind of like the remedy, the antidote to this restriction that we felt earlier in the month when everything felt Saturnine and it was closing in and holding us back. And we still have some of that energy, and I'll explain where that's coming from in just a moment. And the other thing is that by the 29th, Mars moves from Pisces into Aries, where Mars gains force. It gains speed. It gains energy because Mars is at home in in Aries. And in Pisces, especially as it conjoined Neptune, there was this feeling like, I'm lost. I don't know where I'm going. I just know that I need to tra- stay true to my integrity, to my dreams, but I don't know where they're leading me. I don't know how I'm going to get there. So by the 29th, we can see that Mars has passed its conjunction with Neptune. And 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 yet Mars still being in Pisces, there's still this, this dispersive energy. But the other thing that happens in, in on the 29th is that Venus leaves Aries and moves into Taurus, and now Venus is in her power. Venus is back home. We had a flavor of this when the sun moved into Taurus back on the 19th, and now we have Venus and Taurus too, and even though Jupiter is inching away from its exact conjunction with Uranus, it's still within a degree or so, but Venus moving into Taurus is giving us another sense of how do we ground this energy? How do we put this into the three-dimensional world? This is now Venus moving through Taurus, which it, it stays in Taurus um, through much of the month <clears throat> um, of, of May. Um, and, um, and yet right behind it, we have Mars, which is at 29 degrees of Pisces, having already caught up with Neptune. And by the 30th, uh, Mars moves out of Pisces and into Aries, and now Mars is at home. So we have Venus at home in, in Taurus, and Mars at home in Aries, and I think April has been an intense month and a crazy month all through the month, but by the end of the month and the beginning of, of May, boom, we're, the, we're on track somewhere. Things are gaining power, and, and, and Venus is making that squared back to, um, to, to Pluto. And interestingly enough, the moon um, actually moves into Aquarius on the morning of April 30th at, at 8 o'clock, 8, 8, 19 a.m., the moon moves into Aquarius, which means that by, by um, noon on April 30th, the moon is aligning with Pluto while Venus is making its square to Pluto. Well, it doesn't reach the square until later in the day. Um, it perfects at 9.30, 9.29 p.m. But all of this is just a powerful, powerful ending of April. And then there is a um, third and last thing I want to talk about, which in some ways may be the most important, but it sits in the background right now. It becomes more and more important as um, as the year continues to unfold and as we move into next year. And that is that Venus makes a half square with um, Saturn on, on, on the 30th. Now, normally that would not be a big deal, but remember, Venus is also making a square with Pluto um, on the 30th. So Venus makes a half square with Saturn and a square with Pluto. Now, what that means is that Saturn has to be making a half square with Pluto too. But Saturn moves so slowly that the Saturn half square to Pluto does not perfect until Cinco de Mayo, till the 5th of May. Now, this is really interesting because Saturn moving toward that half square with Pluto is the first difficult transitional aspect that replay that that um, reflects back to the Saturn Pluto conjunction back on in January 
of 2020. Now, remember, January 2020, that um, that uh, Saturn uh, Pluto conjunction on January 12th was within 24 hours the um, the announcement of the what was then called the Wuhan virus and the first mortalities and the announcement of the genome um, and in some ways that whole transitional year of 2020 was tied to Saturn's conjunction with Pluto and now we have Saturn moving into a half square to Pluto. Um, we'll talk more about that when we get to the May forecast but the fact that Venus now is exacerbating that half square is intriguing, is is interesting, because in many ways it's activating the Saturn semi-square or half square to Pluto. So all in all, I think the end of the month is it's it's a powerhouse. The entire month is a powerhouse. And I'm not even sure how best to integrate it. Um, we'll have more to say when we reach the middle of the month at the mid-month update. Um, and uh, certainly by the time we get to the mid-month update, for those of you who get that, and of course, when we get to the May forecast, a lot of April will be already uh, past enough that we'll have something to say about what some of these events were. Uh, but looking forward, um, there's a part of me that, that believes that April will not disappoint. Now, what that means, I'm not sure, because I think that when their major events occur, there are some people who are excited by them and think this is exactly what needs to happen. There are other people who say, oh my God, this is not what I was expecting. This is not what needs to happen. And I think that April will show us some of those events that will be complicated because they may continue the um, ongoing uh, polarity bifurcation that we've been seeing over these recent years. And yet I think April also sets in motion a tone, a tone for some of the these polarities to ultimately resolve or at least to be ameliorated. That's it. What a month. Uh, I, I, again, I've never seen an, a, a month that was so chock full of so much energy and intensity um, as this month. And I think we'll just need to see how it plays out and if April actually lives up to its astrological expectations. So in closing, what I want to say maybe more than ever is that it's great to do all this intellectual um, exploration through astrology, through whatever tools and techniques you might use. It's fantastic to um, engage in you know cosmic dialogue and think about all the planets, but we have to bring them down to Earth. That a Jupiter uh, conjunction to Uranus is certainly out there. Um, a, a solar eclipse is something that, that has to do with a blinking on and off of the lights of a hiding of something that allows us to see something that wasn't there. These things are all great, that, that we can isolate every one of these events and go, these are all important events. But unless we take our awareness and make something happen in our individual lives, unless we, we turn those um, ideas into priming the pump, unless we actually then work that pump, create the rituals that then create the flow that then allows these things to come to fruition, unless we think cosmically and act locally, there's no use at all in thinking cosmically. So think cosmically, act locally. I'm Rick Levine. Best blessings. Stay safe out there and in here. It's going to be quite a month.